Colossians chapter 3. We'll start at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body. And be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Thank you. That's it. Now, this is what I want to share. Yesterday, as I was studying for the message, praying about it, what came to me was the Lord brought my mind back to when I had strep throat. I was about 15, 14 or 15, 13 or 14. My throat had turned all shades of, when I looked at it in the mirror, my throat had been hurting for over a month. And it had black spots, red clumps, white clumps. It looked like it, my throat was rotting to death. My tonsils were rotting. And it finally, and when it got that bad, I got scared. That's what scared me enough to tell my father my throat had been hurting. Because I didn't tell him. I knew he'd take me to the doctor in a New York minute. And I did not want to go to the doctor because I don't like needles. So here I am as a teen, as a, a teeny bopper, a little adolescent, not wanting to go to the doctor, but I couldn't take the throat anymore. I was used to the pain, but I couldn't tolerate the thought of where this looked like it was going. It scared me. So my father took me to the doctor. The doctor looked at my throat. He said, you have acute tonsillitis. He said, I don't know how you lasted a whole month dealing with this. He said, but we're going to get rid of it. And he gave, pulled out this long needle filled with penicillin and stuck my right cheek. I remember right where he stuck it. I hated it. But guess what? Within a matter of three or four hours, that sore throat stopped hurting altogether. I was shocked. I didn't know it would work. It would start working that fast. I could have had relief long time ago. Here I was hurting for a whole month. I'm making a point. This is a point, you guys. I was hurting for a whole month, for 30 days or more. When I could have gotten rid of that within a matter of hours. Think about that. We are the body of Christ. We have to support one another. We have to care for one another. We have to gird each other up. We have to be there for one another. But as the body, we cannot tolerate the devil oppressing any one of us. You as an individual should never allow the devil to oppress you. You shouldn't put up with it. You got the penicillin you need. J-E-S-U-S. -S. We as a body of Christ, as a church family, should never sit back and casually watch our brother or sister be oppressed by the devil. You hear what I'm saying? Some of as each one of us helps each other, sometimes we got to snatch each other out of the very fire. But we cannot sit back casually, complacently, and say, 
Ooh, so sorry, Charlie. So sad. Hmm. And just say a little lightweight prayer and move on. No, no, you got to have something to speak into someone else's life. That's your brother or sister in Christ. Now, when you allow something, many people, this is where we fall short as born again Christians. Many people tolerate things in their lives they should never tolerate. Some of you have been oppressed by the devil for so long. It's what you call your norm. But this is your land. God commands every one of us to go in and possess our land. Possess it. Don't let someone else squat on your land. And that's what a lot of people do. They let others squat on their land. Some of you date the wrong one, baby. And it goes even to marrying the wrong one. And you've allowed that person to squat on your land for so long that you feel like you have no more rights. And you are nothing but a victim. A victim of circumstance. This is your land. God gave you the authority. You rise up and you possess your land. You don't let somebody else rule over your land, rule over your destiny, rule over you with a hard iron fist. You don't allow that. You have God girding you up. Why are you letting somebody that, that pees the same way you do oppress you? Why would you work at a job that oppresses you? Why would you live under conditions that are oppressive? Now, when it comes to us as a body of Christ, God called us to support one another. There are times when we have to use tough love and tell the truth, calling a spade a spade. I may have to get on Juanita's case one day and tell her, Juanita, I'm going to tell you under the authority of God, you need to cut that loose. I may have to get on Brian's case one day and say, Brian, she's only using you. Cut that loose. See, we're part of the body. We can't allow each other to get caught up in the devil's traps. We see a person that we love that's in the body of Christ, that's, that we're in relationship with, get caught out there. And we just fold our arms and wait and see what happens. No, we have to pray for that brother or sister. We have to intercede for one another. We are part of the same body. If you look at a hand, we got five fingers to that hand. The thumb has to work in coordination with the pinky. The pinky has to work in coordination with the ring finger and so on. These fingers do not work independently of each of the body of, of, of the human being. It doesn't work independently. You cut the hand off, you cut the thumb off, you cut the pinky off. Whatever you cut off is going to lay there and die. It must stay connected to the body. And we must keep strengthening that bond between one another. If I see Marlene going down the wrong road, I need to snatch her by her belt and say, get back in, sit down, girl. You crazy. Don't let the devil do that to you. Now, she may get mad at me because she doesn't want to hear it at that moment. But I have to love her enough to risk her being mad at me for a minute. That little short moment, that little, that little shot in the booty, that little, 
uh, split second pinch, that ouch. I got to be willing to allow that in order to rescue her from a month or years of pain. See, many of us would rather slow cook, would put ourselves in a slow cooker because we don't see any harm in it. I didn't see any harm in having a sore throat. I got sore throats all the time. Anytime I'm trying to fight a cold, it starts with a sore throat. I'm used to it. I never had my tonsils taken out. So it works because it warns me. My tonsils warn me. Take this, that, and the other. And when I take this, that, and the other, it fights it and kicks the cold out. And I don't catch a cold. But sitting there allowing a sore throat to turn into tonsillitis. And it goes from tonsillitis to chronic tonsillitis. And chronic tonsillitis turns into acute tonsillitis. It's getting serious now. You can start allowing toxins to poison your bloodstream. You don't know how that could lead to other complications. Letting it be. Some things in your life you should never let be. If you saw a mouse trying to get in your door, you get, get it out before it could get in. You would not tolerate that. If you saw a rat, oh yeah, boy, it's, it's out of here. A fly, you swat it before it gets in your door. You don't allow certain things in your house. Why do you allow certain people in certain situations in your life. Why? Why do you allow that? Why would you even tolerate? Doing something ignorantly is one thing. But having your eyes wide open, seeing what you're getting into, and making excuses. I don't get that one. You can live a pain-free life. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll never feel any pain. My point in that is when God rules over your life, rules over your heart, and he's protecting you, he's for you, and you're working in cooperation with his ways, you literally obligate him through your obedience to him, to intervene for you at every turn. And he does. You got to fight with him. You got to live with him. You got to walk with him. You got to consult with him. You have to acknowledge him in all your ways. And yes, he will direct your path. You do not want him to turn you over to a reprobate mind because you see the trap you make excuses for the trap because within the trap, there's your favorite bite of cheese. And you're going to get that piece of cheese because you that's your favorite cheese. But you got to figure out how to get past the trap. It's not going to happen. Don't look for the trap for your source. Look to God. God can freely give you your favorite cheese without you being at risk. God can freely give you the love, the husband, the wife you need without you being at risk. Don't look within the devil's traps for your mate, for the love you've always wanted. Don't look for the devil's traps to get the money you're looking for. Don't settle for sin. Don't sell your birthright. One of our church members had a revelation about selling the birthright. It was Lynn, I believe. If my old mind serves me correctly, y'all forgive me if I'm wrong. But the revelation is 
just like Esau sold his birthright. You hear me? Just like Esau sold his birthright, we have to be careful not to sell our birthright the same way he did for a morsel of food. When we do not take the mark of the beast, you hear me? We, some folks are going to get hungry. And some of y'all, your belly means more to you than your eternity. And you, some of you will bow and step into the devil's trap and take the mark in order not to be hungry. And you will have sold your birthright. And it will be permanent. There's no point of return once you take the mark. Some of you are trapped right now in abusive marriages because you chose to step into the devil's trap and you ended up with a trick bag that you can't get out of. You can't see your way out of. But God will make a way of escape if you go to him. But you're more intimidated by the trick bag you're in, then you are having faith in God's ability to free you up. Some of you are more intimidated by your trick bag, by the trap you're caught up in because you're living in constant pain like I did with the tonsillitis. You're living in constant pain and some of you have been in it for 10 to 20 years. Why? Because you're afraid of the consequences of trying to get free. So you endure the pain rather than risking life and limb to break free permanently. I would rather live a life without a leg or an arm and be free in my spirit, in my mind, in my emotions than to live in bondage under someone else's tyranny for 20 years of my life? You're crazy. I know some of you may have seen the coming attractions of the movie. Um, I forget her name. Uh, anyway. But the bottom line is they show her standing on the bridge and her slave owner, her slave master is coming to get her. She ran away. She's standing on the bridge and there's nothing below but the rapids. And she doesn't know how deep, how shallow. She's willing to jump and risk her very life, risk dying in order not to live another moment in bondage. She's willing to take that chance because she wants her freedom that badly. She's not afraid of the master. She's afraid of living in bondage for the rest of her life and she won't have it. So she jumps. And as a result, she's used by God to free a lot of slaves. But here's the thing, some of you will not risk your life for freedom. You won't risk it. You have a roof over your head. The man pays the bills. The man puts food on the table, but he rules over you with a hard iron fist. And every couple of times a year, you've got to go and get a bone reset because he's busted you upside the head so many times. And you suffer great injuries, but you'd rather do that than, than risk your life getting free. You've lived under bondage so long, you're like an inmate. You're like the inmate that's been in jail or prison for 20 or 30 years, you're so institutionalized, so oppressed in your mind, you can't imagine a life of freedom where you make your own decisions. 
The inmate is used to asking permission to use the bathroom, asking permission to do this, that, or the other, hoping they don't get their butt whooped this week like they did last week and the week before. They're locked in. They can't get free. But you, you're sent on an errand. You can walk and get yourself free. But you won't. Shame. Satan clouds you and blankets you with shame. What are you ashamed of? You're not the one beating yourself up. Get your behind up out of there. Nobody's keeping you in it but you. Some of you are in toxic relationships. Some of you are in situations you should not be. You have settled for second, third, fourth, not even best, but you're at your worst. You're at the low ebb of your life, the bottom of the totem pole. You're settling for garbage. You're living off of junky love. You're living a life of a, of a victim of abuse. And you could break free, but you don't. You're living a life where your friends, you hang out with your friends and they use you. Every time you go somewhere, they want you to pay for it. They want you to come pick them up. They want you to do them a favor. They want you to come to their rescue. They call on you when they need you, not when, because they don't want you. You don't have, I mean, you know, they don't care about you, but you're a good ticket. You're a good ticket and you know it. But you do it anyway. Why? You don't want them to get mad at you. Really. So you live a life of pain, allowing all kind of people to oppress you. There are some of us that can't even afford to be around our own family members. Some of you need to cut some of your family loose for a while. Take a vacation, a long vacation. Because you know what your family members do to you. You know how they oppress you. But you allow it. Just because it's all you know doesn't mean it's all there is. Think about that. You really want to change in your life? Do you really want to change? Sometimes you have to cut the most precious thing loose in order to give you time for God to heal you and make you healthy enough mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually in order to be able to go back and help rescue some of your brothers or sisters, some of your children, some of your siblings. Whatever the case may be, you're going to need God for this. Now, back to the body of Christ. There are many of us who have conversations with each other. And we know when we listen to each other across the table, that the one, the brother or sister in Christ we're talking to is not making the best choice. But we keep our lips sealed. Why? Because we live by the, by the human policy of, my name is Wes, I'm out of that mess. Sometimes you got to get in it to win it. You got to get in it to help them to get out of it. You got to open your mouth and speak truth into their lives. They may not want to hear it, but they will be back to you when their eyes open and they get sick of it and they're ready for some help. They know who to come to because you loved them enough to warn them. Who do you know who is in the body of Christ? You know is barking up the wrong tree. Are you opening your mouth or are you sticking your head in the sand 
acting like you see no evil, hear no evil, speak no, I'm out of that. Do you love them enough to get your feelings hurt trying to protect them from doing something ridiculously crazy and self-destructive? Huh? Do they mean enough to you to open your mouth and speak the truth? Speak God into them. Speak truth into them. Warn them. Warn them. Warn them. There are people, some of you know, you know you need to open your mouth and say something. And you won't warn them. And one of our members was talking about a family they knew. But they were young. They didn't know that these people were abused. They didn't know it. But some of you know, some of you know that you got friends stepping off into dabbling into too much sin. You know what they're doing. Some of you know some of your uh, family members or your church family members that are getting ready to step into a toxic relationship. You know it. You know they're feeling needy and and undesirable and all of that so they're willing to stoop down and settle they're willing to bow and you're not saying anything it's not their business if they're part of the body of christ you wonder why the body has so little power in these last days too many of us will say nothing. Too many of us will agree to sin. Too many of us will settle. Too many of us are so given to our appetites and our, our basic uh, animal needs and desires that we won't do what it takes to live a life of freedom. You think giving up your sins is giving up your freedom. No, baby, you have never experienced freedom until you give it all up for God. Once you experience his freedom, baby, it's a whole difference. Just like when I had that, uh, that acute tonsillitis, all I had to do was get the shot. I could have been free long time ago from all that pain and discomfort, all that infection and fever. Some of you live a life of acute sickness, a life of acute dysfunction, a life of acute volatile un unrest, volatile torment, because you won't go to your penicillin. You won't go to the doctor to work your life out and heal you. Because you don't want to give that up. You don't want to give that up. You're afraid. What is it going to be like if I go with God? If I go to God, oh no, I'm going to, I can't do that and I can't do that and I can't. So you rather live a life of pain so you can do all you want to do. But the difference is when you go to God and you give up the nonsense, you can be all that you want to be. There is no limit in God, but you place the limits on yourself because you don't want to give up some stuff. You don't want to go to the doctor and he sticks you because you don't want to hurt. See, many of y'all, you live a life of entitlement. You don't want to hurt. You do not want to hurt, which means you don't want to do without the nookie. You don't want to do without the money. You don't want to do without the privilege. You don't want to do without the pride, the image. You don't want to be alone. You have no idea that all the love you've been longing for, scratching and digging in all the wrong places, God has for you. And you don't have to bow and suck booty in order to get that love. You don't have to degrade yourself and be used and kicked to the curb in order to get that love. God has all the love you need. God has all the peace you need. 
God is love. He's the source because he is. He said, I am that I am, which means he is everything. You need that? He is. You need that? He is. You need money? The Lord shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. You need inner healing? The Lord shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. You need company? You're lonely? Guess what? God will take time out of eternity and keep you company. He'll send a saint. Come ring your doorbell, call you up and say, hey, the Lord laid you on my mind. You want to go do something? You want to go have dinner? Why? Because you acknowledged him in all your ways. You didn't stoop and, and trip over there to the devil's trap and settle for a piece of something that you need, for an unreasonable facsimile of what you need. No, you went to the source. And when you went to the source, God supplied your need completely without you having to get your hands dirty, without you having to bow and suck booty to get it. Hello. Without you having to allow yourself to be trapped, tied up, tangled up in a web of deceit, in a web of abuse. You didn't have to bow yourself down and settle for a life of degradation just to have a little piece, a little imitation of something. When God's got the real deal, baby, everything you think you need, everything you think you're aspiring to is God. I am that I am. I needed to be accepted. God accepted me. I needed to be loved. God loved me. I needed peace. God put peace in my heart. I needed company one night. God came and kept me company. I needed solutions to my problems. God provides all my needs according to his riches and glory. I need comfort. God comforts me. I need my head up because I'm hanging low. I'm depressed. God is the lifter up of my head and does it all the time. I got my feelings hurt. God comes and removes the hurt and heals my heart. Anything you need, God is. But you're ready to settle for the beggarly elements of life. You want to eat off the devil's dinner tray. And eat imitation food, imitation sustenance, imitation love, imitation peace, imitation joy, rather than go to the source of the real deal and live a full life, a life of fullness, completeness, inner satisfaction. What are you doing? You're drinking out of dirty cysteines, wells of stagnant water with all kind of larvae swimming in it, smelling like sulfur, full of bacteria and waste. Rather than go to living water, fresh water that cleanses your spirit, that satisfies your thirst. What are you doing? Kissing up to the devil when you can reach up to God. Oh, why would you settle for the one that hates you with a cruel hatred when you got the one right there within reach who loves you with an everlasting love? God is your penicillin, not the devil. Not this world. God is your penicillin. He will heal whatever ails you physically, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, 
financially, circumstantially, socially. He will heal whatever ails you. But no, you like Esau, you want your instant gratification. So you settle for the devil's dinner tray and you give up your birthright to all the beauty God has within reach. And you're in a hurry. You want what you want. You want it now. You don't want to wait on the Lord and be of good courage. No, you want instant gratification. And that's what the devil falsely promises you. So he gives you a trinket here and a trinket there. And you take the bitter with the sweet because you know that most of it's not good for you. But he gonna give it to me now. Why live beneath your privilege? Why settle for broken cisterns when God has your well of living water that never runs dry, never runs stagnant, never has any bacteria or anything harmful or toxic in it? Why settle for a life of sin? For instant gratification, things that tickle the flesh, things that titillate your senses. Really? So you take all the devil's bitter, all the devil's garbage, all the oppression that comes with it. You sell your soul. Hmm. Do you really want to spend the rest of your life that way? Do you really want to watch your loved ones self-destruct while you sit quietly by and say nothing? God tells us to go in and possess, the, possess our land. The possession of your land takes fight. You got to fight for what belongs to you. It's not going to come to you, baby, because Satan's going to put up all kind of resistance. But while he's trying to resist you, you resist him. The Bible says if you resist the devil, he'll flee. But no, you ain't resistant because you want instant gratification. You want yours now. You don't want to go the way of God. You say you're an adult, but you think as a child. You act as a child. You behave as a child. You want childish things. You do childish reactions. You'll pout if you don't get yours now. You don't want to play. But guess what? God teaches you to grow and mature. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, not yours. Satan will tell you your might is enough. Satan will tell you, I got what you need, buddy. Come on. I got a little something, something for you, baby. Come on over here. Let me show you this. Come on, come on. Psst, psst, come on, let me show you. Now, see, now, see, now, you ain't got to go through all that. No, I got it right here for you, baby. I'll even let you have some of it for free, but I won't even charge you. Yeah, basically, what he's telling you is come into my parlor. Said the spider to the fly. You get to do it to do. Oh, oh, goody, I'm gonna get mine now. Oh, goody, really? And then the devil will say, Come on over here, baby. Come on, back it up to me now. Back it up to me. Now bend over. And he socks it to you. Next thing you know, you can't straighten up. He's sodomizing your life. He's sodomizing your dignity. He's sodomizing your future. Screwing you up from head to toe and you're still bent over. When all you got to do is straighten yourself up and, and fly right. Ask God to forgive you and get your act together and let him straighten you and clean you up. But no, no, you go through the pain. You go through all those years of pain to get a few moments of, gra of gratification. Of course, Satan's gonna throw in a little good with the bad 
to keep you coming back for more. That's what the drug dealer does. Gives you a few freebies here and there to keep you on the hook. Huh. <coughs> See, some of y'all coming out of this world, some of y'all is going to take, is going to take the pain and the fear of coming through withdrawal for a drug addict. There's got to go through 24, 48 hours of detox. That's painful and scary. But if they want it bad enough, they'll go through it and come out on the other end. My question to you, and I'm going to end with this. Do you want this bad enough? Do you really want to live? Do you really want to be loved? Do you really want peace and joy? Do you really want it? Or are you going to bend over and let the devil sodomize your life?